Yeah, goodness, goodness, goodness. Remember that. Yeah. I am redeemed. He set me free. He's the one that redeemed us, and he set us free, which is exactly what uh, the fifth chapter of the book of Revelation is all about. You know, we have landed right in the middle of a worship and praise service in heaven when in chapter 4, verse 1, John is called up to heaven, you know, come up here and I'm going to show you uh, the voice of the trumpet. Uh, Who is the voice of the trumpet? Uh, Jesus Christ. (laughs) He's the one with the trumpet voice. And the trumpet voice says to John, come up here and I'm going to show you great and mighty things which shall be hereafter. Not maybe or probably will be or might be, but I'm going to show you what shall be after, here, hereafter. And then he begins to show him around heaven. And uh, three things really occupy John's sights and, is in his, um, and, his, and he deals with it. In chapter three, you know, he, he starts talking about Uh, the one who sits on the throne and the throne, and he starts describing him in chapter 4. He starts describing him like, uh, man, he looks like a diamond, and he looks like a ruby flashing. He's he's hard, and he's brilliant, and he's bright, and he's blazing, and his holiness is flashing, and there's an emerald rainbow, which uh, has to do with the green earth and the symbol of earth, so what they, whatever's happening at the throne is going to be involving earth, and then, then you have these, these creatures flying around. We met last week, and they have four faces and six wings, and they're flying around the throne, and they're saying, and holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. And then you have 24 elders sitting on 24 thrones around the one big throne. Everybody say, the elders are us. Yeah, I mean, the elders represent us. The elders are there uh, as redeemed people. That's what the, where do the elders come from? The elders aren't angels. Because the Bible never calls an angel an elder. Never. One time in the entire Bible is an angel called an elder. We have elders in the church. We have elders in the, in the kingdom of God. That, you know, that's the phrase. That's the term that's used. So what he's trying to show us is that there will be representatives there. That he'll be seated on thrones. It, it could be, <coughs> excuse me, it could be 12 Old Testament leaders like Hebrews chapter 11 might describe. If you want to read that hall of fame of faith uh, in Hebrews chapter 11, you might see some of the Old Testament saints that might be sitting on a throne in heaven. And then maybe 12 New Testament leaders, maybe the apostles. I mean, it seems it's kind of unusual because John would have been one of them if that's what, uh, if they were all the 12 apostles, because John, who's sitting here on the Isle of Patmos being brought up to heaven in the spirit, uh, he would have said, man, I see myself sitting on the, you know, self, huh? you know, uh, but he didn't say it, but, but, but who would it be, you know? I mean, it could be, it could be the apostles and then Judas, you know, is gone and then the apostle Paul is there and then might've been Barnabas or, or Timothy or someone, you know, one of the great, one of the great movers and shakers of the whole New Testament and might be that kind of guy, but whoever they are, they've been chosen by God to sit on these 12 thrones and to worship him day and night. These guys are are worshiping him. These guys, I mean, these are not rulers over anything. They have crowns on their head, but it's not a diadem crown like a king wears. It's a a winner's crown, like an Olympic athlete wins a, a crown. It's that kind of crown, and, and so there, there they are, and they represent us around the throne, and they're worshiping, and so here's all of this just gigantic activity with, with these creatures, you know, flying around that have six wings, and they're full of eyes, and they have uh, these four faces, depending on which direction you look at them, you know, you see one of those faces, the face of a man, the face of an eagle, the face of a calf, you know, an ox or a calf, and the, and, and, the, and the face of a lion, and it's like, whoo, what? What kind of face am I going to see? And, and all this activity and this flashing and this brilliance and this diamond and then lightnings and thunderings and whoo, just going out of, out of the throne, flashing out and all, and all of those directions. And then in chapter 4, John says, boy, a worship service was, I mean, a praise service was just booming out of the throne. It was booming out because Jesus had created everything. They worshiped him because he was the creator of everything. 
What they say to Jesus in chapter four is, you are worthy of praise because you created all this stuff. And so as the creator of everything, we ought to worship you and adore you. And you're worthy of our praise because of that kind of thing. In chapter five, the worship service goes on still and continues still. But the, the, the theme of the worship service changes in chapter five. The theme becomes uh, you're worthy to be worshiped, not simply because you're the creator, but you're worthy to be worshiped because you are the one who redeemed us. You're worthy to be worshiped because you're the one that, that shared yourself on a cross and brought all of us out of that horrible pit that we lived in. All of the stuff we just sang about in the, I am redeemed. You know, I shake off the heavy chains, wipe away every stain. I'm not the man who I used to be. I've been, re I've been redeemed. I met the forgiver and now this sinner will never be the same. What is that? That is redemption. Why can I say that? Because Jesus Christ went to the cross and was crucified there all for me. And he's worthy to be praised. And in heaven, this was worship service that we're brought into right off the bat around the throne of God. John says, you know what's going to be going on for a long, long time in heaven? A worship service where God's on a throne and the elders are on the throne and the angels are standing there and the beasts are flying around and all of us are there in an innumerable way, a multitude that basically no man can number and no man can count. And we're going to be worshiping him because he deserves it because he created us and he deserves it because he redeemed us. It means he made us and then he had to rebuy us. We're his, we're his because he made us. But we got ourselves lost by disobeying his command. And so even though he owned us and could have just, you know, took us back because he's our owner, he bought us back because he had to purchase us from the enemy that had taken us. So he's we're twice, twice owned, once by God and then bought back. That, that's what redemption is. What, if you redeem a coupon, what do you do? You use it. You get stuff with it. It means the same thing for us. He redeemed us. That means he, he, got, he got us back, and he deserves to be praised. Let, let's look at this service real quick, and then we'll look at some of the you know, incidentals that are in here. It is kind of an unusual worship service with some unusual things that are going on that they all mean something. Let's look. And I saw in the right hand of him who sat on the throne. Everybody say, that's God. God. I saw a scroll written inside and on the back, sealed with seven seals. Then I saw a strong angel. Might have been Michael. Probably was Michael. Is described as a strong angel. You know, Michael was one of the archangels. Michael, Gabriel, and Lucifer are the only angels that are mentioned by name in the Bible. The seraphim and the cherubim are, and, the, and, and just angels in general <clears throat> mentioned in quite a few places. But they're not named except Michael, who seems to be the warrior angel, who seems to be the rescue Israel from destruction angel. Seems to be the one who comes down when, when, the, when the enemies of God try to take the ark of God and, and falsify it, you know, and open it up, and 19,000 of them are killed just because they cracked the ark, you know. I think Michael is God's hitman, you know. I mean, he's just like the, he's like the heavenly arrester. And this strong angel all of a sudden proclaims now think the thunderings and the lightnings and the and the and, and the cherubim with the four faces are holy, holy, holy is the Lord God. The, and the elders are bowing and bumping and the holy, holy, holy and just uh, all of this activity is going on and lightning is flashing everywhere. Everything's going on all around. And then all of a sudden, a voice that is so loud that it just arrests everybody there. And it says, it says, a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice. Who is worthy to open the scroll and to loose its seals? 
And boy, everything comes to a screeching halt. There is silence in heaven. No more four creatures flying around, crying, crying, holy, holy. No elders bumping their foreheads on the ground going, holy, holy, holy. Uh, no, no angels around waving their hands and praising him. No saints who've been redeemed by the Lord and have now been called to heaven with him, which is all of us who have been redeemed, by the way. Judgment hadn't started on the earth yet. There's not been one seal broken. But it's about to start, and this out loud angel proclaims, and all of a sudden, buddy, the worship service, there's not a word said, because this strong angel has just asked a question, who is worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals, and everybody goes, Whoa. and they're looking around, not me, not me. They start looking for the back row, kind of like at church, you know. Let me get back here where maybe nobody will notice me, you know. Be quiet back here. Yeah, boy, you're talking about a cosmic killjoy. Good night. This party pooper just pooped the whole party. And then, and no one in heaven, whoo, or on the earth, or under the earth, was able to open the scroll or even look at it. I mean, they weren't even worthy to see it. Good night. That's some unworthiness right there. I mean, it's one thing that you don't have the worthiness to open it and touch it, you know, and break it open. But it's another thing that you don't even have the worthiness to even look at it. Bless God. So John said, I wept much. See, picture it in your mind, the praise party, the lightnings, the thunderings, the flying around, the four-faced creature and the, and the, and the elders and the, and, the, and the angels, and it's just, ah, yeah, holy, yeah, yeah, praise God. You're our creator. You're our God. You're our master. You did it all for us, and, you re and now we're going to praise you because you redeemed us, and, and you did special, and you were slain, and, all. And, then, and then this angel says, who is worthy to open the scroll and unlock the seals? And everybody goes, whoop. And then all of a sudden, the silence is broken with a big wailing, sobbing voice. Wah! I mean, he didn't just let tears roll down his cheeks. He doesn't do like I did every time, like I do every time I hear the national anthem. Boy, don't put some jets flying over with that flag. Brother, I'll break out like a crybaby every time. I'm serious. I'm overwhelmed with that. I love my country. I love the Lord. Call me a deplorable or whatever you want to call me. I love him. And it touches me emotionally. Well, when John sees that nobody is worthy to open the scroll, John just, he says, I wept much. Not just, <laughs> but it was, Wah! and he just stood there because no one was found worthy to open the seal and read the scroll or even to look at it. But one of the elders said to me, so one of the elders got off his throne and comes up there, and there's the old man John. Old man John's about 89 years old. Can you imagine that? Those old withered up cheeks, been out in the hot desert sun, been on the Isle of Patmos, which is nothing but a volcanic rock out in the middle of the sea. Wind blowing and face sunburned and wind burned. He's 80 years old, got a lot of wrinkles and crackles and all of that up in his face and big tears rolling down that old, that old sunburned face. And here comes an elder who gets up off of his throne and comes down there, puts his arm on, on John and starts wiping those tears away from him and says, it's all right, buddy. Don't cry. Settle down. It's going to be all right. Because behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah the root of David has prevailed to open the scroll and to loose its seven seals. 
buddy, don't dry those tears up. Because there's somebody that's worthy. The lion of the tribe of Judah is worthy to open the scroll and unloose its seal. And I looked, and behold, in the midst of the throne and of the four living creatures and in the midst of the elders stood a lamb as though it had been slain. Whew. It's almost John saying, how could I have missed it? You know, I, I saw the throne and I saw the activity and I saw the lightnings and I heard the thunderings and I saw the four-faced cherubim flying around and I saw the elders be bumping on the throne and I saw angels everywhere and I saw the emerald and I saw the, you know, the diamond and the ruby and, 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 and I saw the sea of glass and, and whoo, I mean, it was just the action everywhere and I was just seeing everything and I missed the lamb. How could I have missed the lamb? Yeah, yeah. Which is a good question for us to ask ourselves. Yeah, yeah. In the midst of all kind of activity that seems to be religious and special and righteous and blah, blah. I can come in, I can sing, I can rejoice, I can rejoice. I can go to committee meetings, I can decide things about church, I can go to church fellowships, I can praise and worship, I can play an instrument in the band. And I can miss the lamb who is right there in the midst of us all the time. What a tragedy it would be if you found the church and you missed the lamb. I'm just saying, John looked at it and said, when he said that, I looked a little closer and I said, there's a lamb in there. And the word is ar arion. There are two words that are used for lamb in the Bible. And this one, Arion, means a little lamb. A little lamb. And it looked like he was slain. As though it were slain. What does that mean? That means that when you slay a lamb for an altar, here's what happens. You bring the little fellow to the altar, to the altar, and you deal with the sin that's in your life and in your family's life, and you're kneeling at the altar, and you, got, you have your knife in your hand like this, and you've got his little head holding him like this, under up, got his neck stretched out up under, and whenever you confess and whenever you are about to, to, to make this offering final at this altar where the blood of the innocent is shed for the guilty, then you take a knife and you just cut his little throat and the blood just shh, 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 shh. John said this little lamb in the middle of the throne looked like it had been slain this little lamb had a blood coming out of his throat Whew. probably still bleeding from the cross man John said, how could I have missed the lamb who looked like it had been slain? <laughs> oh, God, night. And in the midst of the elder stood a lamb as though it had been slain, having, wasn't in the order, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God, sent out into all the earth. Then he came and he took the scroll out of the right hand of him who sat on the throne. That word took is the most gentle word for taking that could be used. He didn't snatch it. He didn't wrestle it away. It was like John put his hand up, the lamb put his hand up like that and then received from the one on the throne the scroll. And he, and he just gently t took it like this. He didn't have to fight for it. He didn't wrestle it away. He just took it easily. And now when he had taken the scroll, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the lamb each having a harp. You've wondered, why in the world are we going to be playing harps in heaven? Because John said that the representatives of us, the 24 elders, had a harp. <laughs> Didn't say he was playing it, just said they had it. I, you know, I don't, I'm assuming that if we have it, we're going to be playing on it at some time. But there they are. That's why you see pictures of us in heaven playing harps. They have one, and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. 
And they sang a new song saying, you are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals for you were slain and have redeemed us to God by your blood out of every tribe and tongue and people and nation. And you've made us a, a, a kings and priests to our God and we shall reign on the earth. Then I looked and I heard the voice of many angels around the throne, the living creatures and the elders, and the number of them was 10,000 times 10,000 and thousands of thousands. Everybody say, that's a lot. You saw my math in your notes, right? If I didn't miss a, 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 a place or two, which I, I could have, because it's a whole lot of zeros. Uh, that number right there would be uh, one with 14 zeros after it, which it, unless my, I mean, you know, I, we have to create new terms for numbers now that our national debt goes as high as it does. <laughs> so the number trillion, you know, now it was billions were on her. Now we're in trillions. And if I'm not wrong, that's like a hundred trillion. And I think that's just John's way of saying, man, it was so many of them, I couldn't even think about counting. I mean, woo, it was unbelievable. And what were they doing? Saying with a loud voice, worthy is the lamb who was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. And every creature which is in heaven and on the earth and under the earth and such as are in the sea and all that are in them, I heard saying, blessing and honor and glory and power be to him who sits on the throne and to the lamb forever and ever. Then the four living creatures said, amen. And the 24 elders fell down and worshiped him who lives forever and ever. The end. <laughs> Oh, heavenly worship service. Boy, this was attended by a group, wasn't it? They were doing some stuff, and they were saying some stuff by all of those things that we just read about that we need to hear in our own heart and our own life. Let's see. Let's just see what the Lord basically tells us about this and all of these, uh, all of these different descriptions that are going over here. All right, let's just do it quickly. Um, because I, I know you probably know everything about it, but, but let me just be a little bit redundant about some of these things. Ever since God created this earth and then Lucifer rebelled against God, Lucifer was the anointed cherub that covers. In other words, Lucifer covered the throne of God in heaven. Lucifer was created. He was an angel like Michael and Gabriel, a created being by God. And he, and he led the praise team in heaven. It was Lucifer that, who had beautiful pipes, this way Isaiah 14 describes him, you know? He, he, he was given lovely tones and melodies and, 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 and could do rhythms and harmony. I mean, he, he was the praise leader in heaven. But the Bible said that somehow there was find, found in him some morsel of evil, and he began to say in his heart, I'm going to exalt myself above God. I'll have a throne that's higher than his. I'm going to knock the old man off, and I'm going to rule and reign and take this place from him. And of course, you know, God said, Bim, you know, and slapped him down to earth. He comes tumbling through the universe. And like some unceremonial, you know, blob, he hits the earth and, and becomes the, you know, the ruler of a fallen group of people, all of us. Jesus said, you are of your father, the devil. Talking to a lost person, your father is either God or your father's the devil, one or the other. And ever since that time where God passed him down in Isaiah 14, there's been a cosmic battle going on. And the battle is over. Who has the right to be God on this earth? The big question is, who is worthy to be God on this earth? Who has the authority? Who has the right to sit on the throne of this earth? Is it God or is it the devil? Well, John sees in heaven that this big question is, and I saw the right hand of him who sits on the throne, a scroll, written on the inside and on the back, which means it's very thorough, 
which means it, it has all the information that it needs. It means it is complete in its, in its descriptions and thoughts. It's not some little lightweight notes that are not discreet and, and discriminant. Man, this thing is full of all of the knowledge, all of the wisdom, and all of the understanding that needs to be here. It's written, most scrolls were not written on the back. Most scrolls were only written on the front. And then they'd roll them up, you know, and then they would be able to keep that which was written on the inside safe. But this scroll had so much information that it was written on the front side and the back side. Oh, my Lord, this thing was thorough in its presentation of, of the judgment of God. You say, what was this scroll? Well, this scroll was, and I, I wrote it in your notes, and I'm going to say it and, and, and to hopefully describe to you what it really is. It, it, it's basically the title deed of the earth. I mean, you guys that live in homes of your own, you have a title deed, right? This title deed describes your property and has you on it that says you have the right to do anything to this land that you will want to do to this land because you are the owner of this land. This scroll that is up in heaven that, that nobody's going to be able to open is basically the title deed to earth. It's, it's, the, it's, it, it's, the, it's, it's the scroll that contains who has the right to rule over this earth. Who has the right to open this scroll? Who has the right to take this scroll? Because that obviously gives them the right to rule the earth and reign over the earth. And the earth belongs to them if they've got the scroll because it's the title deed of earth. So this scroll that's open here in chapter 5 of Revelation is, ooh, I mean, this is a terrible thing. Because without it, you have no authority. God doesn't have any authority to judge the world. We'll go on like this forever. There will be no judgment of the lost. There'll be no, there'll be no comeuppance. The earth will never change. It'll be like this forever. The devil will still be losing. Temptation will be flying and death and disease and sorrow and tears and, and loss and, 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 and horror will, will be forever. There, there will be no uh, eternal reckoning where God can create a new heaven and a new earth and, and, and a new Jerusalem and call us into that place to rule and reign with him. That, no None of that can happen if this scroll can't be opened. So I'm telling you, this was a, man, this was a real deal. Who is worthy? And I saw a strong angel proclaiming, who is worthy to open the scroll? Notice he doesn't say, who's strong enough to open it? And he doesn't say, who's willing to open it? Because, you know, there are a lot of men that have lived that would be willing to open it because they've tried to rule the world themselves. Right? A heavenly being that was thrown out of heaven called Lucifer, uh, if you said, who's willing to open it, he probably would have said, I am, I am. I'm willing, I'm willing, God. And, and then Alexander the Great would have probably said, hey, I'm willing, I'd love to rule the world. Genghis Khan probably said, hey, I'm worthy. Uh, I'm willing. I, I'll rule the world. Yeah, and then and then and then people like uh, like Hitler would step forward. You know, he wanted to rule the world. He said, "I'm willing to rule the Ayatollahs of Iran." That's what they want to do is rule the world. So there'd be a lot of people that are willing to rule the world, but the question is not, "Are you willing?" or "Are you strong enough?" The question is, "Are you worthy?" Are you worthy to do this? Who is worthy? Whoo! Oh, and then and the next verse says, and no one in heaven was found worthy. That's kind of a big deal. Think about it. Who's in heaven? Everybody. Everybody that's ever loved God and followed his commands and obeyed him and put Christ as king, all of us are there. Billy Graham's there, you know? 
all of the great preachers, the Billy Sundays and, and, and the Dwight Moody's and, the, and, and all of these famous you know, uh, guys that have led the world in revival and all of those kind of things and all of the saints that nobody's ever heard of that have led thousands to the Lord and those that have given their life and sacrificed and been martyred on the field and have their head cut off and, and have their bodies destroyed and people that have been laid on the ground and pulled apart by horses and have been crucified upside down on an egg-shaped cross People have been fed to lions. People have been burned at the stake. And everybody, all of the people that have ever lived on the earth that are so worthy in the eyes of man, not a one of them stepped up and said, I'm worthy, give me that scroll. Yeah. Whoo! And no angel said, hey, I'm worthy. None of the 24 elders who've been promoted by God to sit on a throne in heaven. Whoo, that's a special place. That God, God said, I'm going to give you authority to sit on a throne and lead the worship up here. I mean, you would think that one of those guys would have been worthy. Paul wasn't there. John wasn't there. Peter wasn't there. You know, Timothy wasn't there. Whew. Matthew wasn't there. Luke wasn't there. John is there, but he certainly feels intimidated. You can tell by what he's writing, this place is just overwhelming him. He's representing us. This is God saying, you'll be there, and this is what you're going to be seeing. That's what Revelation is. Revelation says, let me let you see what's going to happen. And so John is called up so we can see what we are going to be experiencing in heaven. And, one, and when we get there, all of a sudden, you're going to be right in the middle of this service. And you're going to be like the throne standing around and you're going to see this strong angel and you'll get to see, you know, if it's Michael or whoever it might be. You know, it could be Gabriel, you know, he's the one that spoke to Mary and he's the one that spoke to Joseph. I mean, he's the messenger angel, you know, that speaks to people on earth. It might have been him that screams with a loud voice. But we'll get to see who it is and we'll be sitting there and, and, and we'll be tense. With, Not a word. We're going to be going, who is worthy? We'll be thinking, oh, somebody's going to say something in a minute. Somebody's going to jump up and say something. Man, it's just silence, pin dead. And no one in heaven or on the earth, the Antichrist, the beast that powers the Antichrist, the anti, anti God, you know. You have the heavenly triune on the earth, the anti-God, the anti-Christ, and the anti-Holy Spirit called the false prophet. None of them said, I'm worthy. Boy, nobody on earth, and nobody under the earth. Hell kept its mouth shut. Nobody in hell said, hey, I'm worthy to open the seal. Let me up out of here, and I'll come hold the scroll and open the seal. John said, nobody said anything, and the scroll could not be opened, and, and, and it couldn't even be looked at. And John said, when I saw that, I just broke down. Why did he break down? He broke down because it, without the scroll being opened, the earth is going to stay just like it is now ruled and reigned over by a, a, a demonic despot that wants to continually entice and seduce and deceive and will be fallen forever and there'll be no uh, there'll be no rapture no re no 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 resurrection there'll be no heaven and a throne of Christ and the judgment seat of God and no creation of a new heaven and a new earth because all of that is with the title of the earth which that scroll is and John said nobody was going to be worthy, and I'm going, no, it can't end like this. Whew. John said, boy, that just tore me up. Ooh, because no one was found. And then he balls off of there and falls, and, and, uh, and he's weeping and he's wailing. So the big question is, who's worthy? Who, who's going to rule the world? Well, a big question calls for a big answer, and here's the answer. This is Jesus' answer to the question, who, who has the right to rule the world? Verse 5, but one of the elders said to me, don't weep. Just so compassionate. 
That had to be an elder that, that had the gift of mercy, right? You know, it had to be somebody who, who, got, who felt like John felt and, 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 and just responded and said, this poor fella, I mean, good night. Look at him, he's all tore up. And John's probably sitting there just heaving. I mean, like you do wailing now. This is not some gentle little weeping stuff. Man, he's, he, he's, he's bellowing out. And you know how you feel when somebody's bellowing out, crying behind you. What do you want to do? You want to run over there and grab them and say, it's all right, honey. It's all right, honey. Well, all the elders just sit there on the throne except one of them. And he comes out and he grabs them and he begins to wipe those tears. He it's all right. It's all right, buddy. It's all right. Because behold, the lion of Judah. Oh, oh. man, I'm going to tell you, when John heard that phrase, the lion of Judah, I'm going to tell you his tears stopped immediately. His heart leaped or leapt. Which one is it? Leapt. His heart leapt. <laughs> Whichever one. His heart leapt up in him, you know. And, 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 and all of a sudden, those tears were turned to joy and a smile crawling. When he heard the lion of the tribe of Judah, bed, that's what the Jews had been waiting on. Yeah, that's the kind of Messiah the Jews wanted, a lion of the tribe of Judah, a root of David. That's what, that, that's what they thought the Messiah was going to be, a lion that would come down and crush the Romans and crush the government of earth and crush the people that discriminated against them. You're talking about discrimination, man. No people on the face of the earth have been discriminated against more than the Jews. Everybody wants to kill them. They haven't lived a moment on earth where there wasn't somebody that wanted to kill them just because they're a Jew. Right now, there are people that say they don't have the right to be alive on this earth. And they're the people that live all around them. They wouldn't even recognize them as a state. They don't have, uh, they, they, they say, let's wipe them off the earth because they don't even have a right to live, those dogs. And that's the attitude of this world. Whew. Don't even get me started on that. But the Jews said, give us a lion messiah. Whew. A militant lion messiah. He's the root of David. Yeah, he comes from David's lineage. You remember Matthew says he went all the way back to Abraham and he brought him all the way through and David, the king of Israel, was in that lineage and then, and then and, and, and Luke, he, he went back, took Mary's lineage, went back all the way from Adam, Mary is his, his earthly mom, and, and brought her lineage all the way from Adam all the way through and, and, and her tribe was the, the tribe that David was from, King David. Holy, holy so he's standing there and the, <laughs> and the elders wiping his eyes and patting him and saying, it's all right, buddy, the lion of the tribe of Judah. And John goes, the lion, the lion. The, look, 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 the Jews killed Jesus because he was too tame. The Jews didn't receive him as Messiah because he wasn't a lion. He was meek and lowly and gentle and taught forgiveness of your enemy and all of that kind of stuff. And they didn't want a Messiah like that. They wanted a militant lion that would crush and powerful. And bleh, I mean, Jesus was too tame for them. So let's get rid of him. He's not worthy. So that's what happened. And, and, and so John's sitting there and he's saying, all right, whoo, when I turn around, when I turn around, I'm going to see this giant mane. Woo! When I turn around, I'm going to be, there's going to be this giant gaping jaws of a killing machine and big teeth and, you know, and, 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 and this powerful throat. And uh, when I turn around, I'm going to see a lion. And bless God, he's going to be the lion of the tribe of Judah. And John turns around. And when he turns around, expecting gaping jaws and big mane and teeth, uh, hey, uh, it's like, what? Where, where's the lion? That's a lamb. A lamb. And it's not only a lamb, it's a little lamb. Woo. Boy, you don't think God is extraordinary? 
here's a little lamb with his throat cut. Now think about this. During the tribulation, the devil is a big red dragon just bellowing out death and destruction on this earth. He is a big, red, fiery dragon with all the power he needs, with all the people of the earth following him, with all the militant armies of the world dragging along behind him, saying, let's kill the Jews, let's get rid of everybody on earth. I mean, he has all the power, all the might, all the majesty. He is a gigantic, big old, red, flame-throwing dragon big as he needs to be with everybody behind him. And, and up against that, God sends a little lamb. This is not a fair fight, is it, God? Well, neither was David and Goliath. God always takes the little and confounds them. You know, that's exactly what Paul told us was going to happen. I don't know if you've ever read it in 1 Corinthians, but he says, you know what God does? God takes the 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 ignorant to confound the wise. He takes the, the weak to confound the mighty. Yeah, he takes those who are detestable. Everybody say a basket of deplorables. He takes everybody who is a basket of deplorables to bring to nothing those smart Alex who think they know everything. And he takes the base things of this world and the things that are not to take care of the things that are. That's the way God operates. So everybody will know it's God. Come on, man. Whoo! And so here they are. This little lamb with his throat cut. But he's not ordinary. He has seven horns. Which horns are symbols of power, guys. Hey, listen. When you see the word horn, it's used for power. It's like a ram. And this one has seven of them. Seven means complete in the, in, in the Bible. God rested on the seventh day. Creation was finished on the seventh day. We worship every, you know, seventh day. All of the things of God are perfect and complete. They are seven. And so what he's saying here is this, is this horn which represents power. He has seven of them. So that means he has complete, perfect power. It means he has all the power he needs. It means he has all the power it's going to take to defeat this wicked, gigantic dragon and all these reprobates that are following behind him. Because God is all-powerful. He is omnipotent. And he said he had seven eyes. Eyes represent the ability to see everything. He has complete sight of everything. He has complete knowledge because of this. He knows everything because of this. You can't run from God. You can't hide from God. You, he, he, he knows where you went. He knows what you said. He knows what you did. He knows why you did it and how long you stayed. He knows everything about you because he sees everything. And this lamb was not only omnipotent, all-powerful, but he was all-knowing. The word omniscient comes out. God knows everything. So this lamb is omnipotent and omniscient. But that's not all. This lamb contained the seven spirits of God, which we all know because of the book of, the book of Isaiah that these are, uh, this is a representative, representative of the Holy Spirit of God. The Holy Spirit has seven characteristics about him, and, and, and they're listed in Isaiah. We've gone over them several times. You don't need to see, hear the list again. But he has all kind, he has seven spirits that make up the Holy Spirit. So this is saying he's everywhere on the earth. So he has all power, he has all knowledge, and now he has all presence. He is everywhere at one time. This is the Lamb of God. Then he came and he took the scroll out of the hand of him who sits on the throne. Whoop! Man, so he walks toward the throne, the lamb does, and the big mighty hand of God, the right hand of power, that hand, and if that hand didn't want to let go, you weren't going to take it out of it. The right hand is the hand of power, 
When it's used, it means that's the hand of strength. That's the hand that no man can open, no demon can open, no angel can open. And that's where you're held in the, in the hand of God. It's a good thing because the devil would get you if he, <laughs> if he could. But he can't because to get you, he'd have to open the hand of God and he can't open God's hand and you're in his hand. It's what he tells us. And so the lamb approaches and the lamb reaches up like this and then the right hand of God just kind of places it in and he just gently takes it because God's given it to him. Now suppose... Suppose God had said to him, upon what basis do you have the worthiness to take this scroll out of my hand? What if, what if God said, said, hey, do you have, are you really worthy to take this scroll out of my hand? Would he have had any recourse to that? Could he have said anything? I think he could. You know what he could have said? He could have said, yes, I have the authority because it's mine by creation. You remember the Gospel of John? What does the Gospel of John say? And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God, and without Him was not anything made that was made. That, that verse tells us Jesus made everything. So he could have said, you know, I'm worthy because I made all this to start with. It's mine by creation. And then he could have said another reason is because of Calvary. Not only did I create it, I gave my life for it. On a cruel, rugged, torturous cross, I shed my blood. I was beaten beyond recognition. I was humiliated and intimidated and spat on and beaten my people I came to save. So it's mine. I created it. It's mine. I redeemed it. And he said, it's mine because I, I, I'm the king over it. I have conquest. I'm ruling over it. And I rule with a rod of iron. And I'm going to rule this whole place. And so by the only thing that people on this earth understand, power, he said, I'm powerful enough to do what's necessary on this world. I have all power and all strength and I'm about to pour it out on this earth. So he takes the scroll out of God's hand and then he came, he took the scroll out of the right hand of him who sat on the throne and then a big praise party starts. And I'm gonna hit this real quick. Let me just get on it and get off. I haven't said that word praise party in a long time. We used to have things we call praise parties, but we hadn't had one. I guess every time we sing on Sunday morning, that's a praise party. I mean, really, it's what it is, is a praise party. A worship. Praise means to brag on Jesus. Worship means to tell him why you're bragging. Why is he worthy? You know, worship him. And so there's a big praise party, and look at what happens in it. Now, when he had taken the scroll, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the Lamb, each having a harp and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. Isn't it amazing that these elders have been given golden bowls? I told you about the harps, and I don't really know. You know, it doesn't, that's, that's the only thing that's mentioned about them. I don't know where we'll play on them or, you know, whatever we're going to do, but it, the assumption is the reason we have them is because we're going to play on them, you know. Uh, whether you have any ability or not, you've got a harp and it's going to be you know, part of your uh, worship. The Hebrew word zamar means to praise God with an instrument. Let your guitar praise God. Zamar. Let your, let, your, let your keyboard praise God. Zamar. Let the instruments sing the worth of God. So I guess that harp's going to do it. And then he's carrying this golden bowl full of the feeble prayers of the saints that have been on earth. Now think about it. Your bowl, you have a bowl. And every time you pray, incense goes into that bowl in heaven. Are you, have you filled your bowl up? I mean, come on now. I mean, you know, what's your bowl going to look like? Is the elder holding your bowl going to go, oh my Lord, this sucker never talks to God. Man, I, I pour this out and they won't even notice it. It'll just be a little... There's not enough incense here to, 
you know, to kill a gnat, man. Come on. I mean, get with it, baby. Get on your knees and let's praise God. How about it? And let's talk to God and let's pray to God because I'm going to take your feeble little prayers and I'm going to put it over here and I'm going to pour it out like incense and its fragrance is going to dwarf up into the nostrils of God and it's going to please God and be a sweet smelling savor unto God. Whoa, man. Man, it, 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 it's some stuff happening up there. And they sing a new song saying, Worthy is the Lamb to take the scroll and open its seal, for you were slain. Whoa. You know why we having this praise party? Because you were slain. Good night, man. We love you. We rejoice over you because you were slain for us. I mean, think about it a second. Think about it. The beloved son of God. The beloved son of God was born in a barn. Grew up as the son of a simple carpenter. No frills. was a homeless cosmic vagabond who landed on this earth and he said, the son of man does not even have a place to lay his head. Suffered unimaginable indignities and torments as he was ridiculed and mocked and spit on beaten with a cat of nine tails, laughed at and mocked. If you're the son of God, who just hit you, man? Come on. <laughs> and then last of all was placed on a old rugged piece of wood and stabbed by a spear and was so beaten up and abused that the Bible said he didn't even look like a man and he became sin for us. He did that all for us. And is that, that means he's worthy of our praise because he took that for us. How could we, how can we not worship him? How can we not praise him? How can we stand with our mouth shut and our heart closed? He's worthy. He did that for us so that this sinner can meet the forgiver and my life will never be the chain, the same. So that I can be redeemed. I've been set free. Shake off those heavy chains. Wipe away every stain. With what? The blood of Jesus. So that's why this is a big praise party going on in heaven. Because you deserve it, Jesus, because you did everything for us and have redeemed us to God by your blood out of every tongue, tribe and tongue and people or nation. This is not angels saying this to God. No angel's ever been redeemed because no angel has ever sinned. They're in heaven. They're not, they don't have a choice. We are only one of God's creations that has a choice. We're the only one that can say, you redeemed us out of every nation, every tongue, every tribe. Do you know that the nation of Israel, not a one of those Jews know what their tribe is? Did you know that? They don't know what tribe they belong to. All of the records were destroyed in 70 AD when the temple was destroyed by Titus the Roman general. So the records were lost and not one Jew, he can say, I'm from Judah, but he can't prove it. He may want to be from Judah, but, but that's just him saying it. They don't know, they don't know who they belong to. But they, but they do when they get to heaven because when we get to heaven, we're going to know everything. Corinthians says, 
Uh, now we see through a glass darkly, but, but then we're going to see face to face. We're going to see God face to face. And then we will know as we are known, what does God know about us? Everything. What will we know when we get to heaven? Everything. You won't have to ask God anything. Y'all know you've said it before. When I get to heaven, I'm going to ask God. No, you're not. No need to. You know everything. And so here we are. We're worshiping, buddy. When we say, you're worthy to be worshiped because you created, you're worthy. And man, and you have made us kings and priests to our God, and we shall reign on the earth. That's what he promised. That's going to happen too. Just a little bit later when these seals and these trumpets and these vials get through being poured out, boom, baby, it's going to be kingdom time, and we're going to sit on thrones and rule and reign with him. You'll, you'll see it. And then I looked and I heard the voice of many angels round about the throne and the living creatures and the elders and the number of them was 10,000 times 10,000 and thousands of thousands. Way more than anybody could count. Saying with a loud voice, worthy is the lamb who was slain to receive what? Power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. <laughs> <laughs> you know what it was like? It was like in heaven, I'm thinking, it was like one of those back and forth choruses that we do sometimes, you know? Now, let's just, let's just do this, all right? All right, the first, little, the first word, let's let these two sections say it. When I, when I, when, as I read it, just when it comes to the first word, the first word in there is to receive power. And then you, this section over here, say it loud, riches. And then this section come back and say wisdom and then strength and then honor and then glory and then blessing. And then we'll say all together, worthy is the lamb. Got it? Let's just see. Saying with a loud voice, worthy is the lamb who was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. Worthy is the Lamb. And that's what was ringing through heaven throughout all of this praise party of God. And he said, you are worthy of all of this. And then he gave us a little picture of what lies ahead. Verse 13 and 14 didn't happen right at the moment that John saw it. You know, John sees a lot of things because there is no time in heaven. I don't know if you know this, and I won't get off on it, but I'll talk about it later at some point, I know. But there's no time in heaven. You know, on earth, we have past, we have present, we have, pr we have present, we have future. When you get to heaven, everything's present. There's no past in eternity, and there's no future in eternity. It's all now. So when you see things in heaven, you see it all now. And so John says, I, I, I can't help but throw this in at the end is what he's saying. He said, let me just tell you what I see happening at the end of stuff. Because that praise party reminded him of a, of a scene that he'll see at the end and you'll see it too. And that's where verse 13 and 14 go. It's, it's like, you know, when you're telling a story and then sometimes you just can't pass up some little detail about what's going to, you know, you say, they, they need to know this. And then you tell them some little addition that's really not happening there, but it's going to happen and you want them to know about it so they can appreciate what's happening now. Well, here, look at this. Uh, and, and this happens at the end now. This happens at the end of everything. When the devil is in the hell bound forever, when we're in heaven with Jesus forever, when there's a new heaven and a new earth and a new Jerusalem, here's what's going to happen in every creature which is in heaven and on the earth and under the earth and such as are in the sea and, and all that are in them. I heard them saying, blessing and honor and glory and power be to him who sits on the throne and to the lamb forever and ever. Then the four living creatures said, amen. And the 24 elders fell down and worshiped him who lives forever and ever. I, I just want you to know that at the end of everything, everything is going to worship him. 
I know I've heard people say, you know, I don't mind going to hell because I'm going to die with my friends. We're going to have a party. We're going to party through eternity in hell. No, you're not. You are going to be tortured and tormented. And on top of that, any moment that God flickers a look down there, you're going to be saying, praise to the lamb. Worthy is the lamb. And every time it's going to stab you in your old wicked heart because you're going to be full of regret and full of guilt because you, while you had a chance, you would not acknowledge him as the lamb of God in your life. You would not accept him as the king of your heart. And they're going to know that they deserve every drop of hell that they're getting. Inherently within, they're going to know he's worthy to open the book and I'm worthy to die and go to hell because I'm wicked and demon-filled and I'm full of the devil and full of evil. And it's going to torture you and torment you, but you're still going to acknowledge him as king. Because the apostle Paul said in Philippians 2, you remember what he said? He said, and God has highly exalted him that at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow and every tongue is going to confess to the glory of God the Father. So I don't care whether you, you say, I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not accepting him as king. Well, if you don't accept him, you got a choice about that, but you're not going to have any choice about acknowledging him as the Lord of this world. And here we are, worthy as him to be worshiped. There we go, praise party. All right, next week, we're going to break some seals. Oh, buddy, business is fixing to pick up. You ain't, and let me just say, you ain't seen nothing yet. Man, these seals, these seals begin to unleash on earth some of that, woo, judgment of God, that glory of God, and it's going to be bad, bad, bad. And just when you think it couldn't get any worse, it's going to get way worse than that. So stand to your feet.